April 9th, 2020. It's about 3.15 Eastern time, and we are live on the HCMA Facebook page. And I am joined with, by, not with, by uh, Dr. Ashley Owens at the University of Pennsylvania. And today we're going to be talking to you about clinical trials in HCM. Um, we're going to first talk a little bit about general clinical trial rules in the United States through the FDA and how that process works so that you understand a little bit more when we get to this individual trial on the drug called Mavicamptin. And we'll explain the trial to you in slides that are a little scientific. So be free, feel free to ask questions on the side if you're watching us live. If you're watching us after we have uh, finished the, tele, uh, the live version, please uh, put a comment on and we'll try to get back to you at a later date. So I'm going to say good afternoon to Dr. Owens and thank you for joining us today. Good afternoon and thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. It is we all got to be doing something stuck in our houses these days, right? So that's right. Let's put some HCM education out there while we're at it. Okay, I am going to. Okay, now we got everybody coming live. All right, so I'm going to start by just going through a couple of slides, and I know they're a little small, they're a little text heavy. You can find this information um, on the FDA website as well. This is not the the slides I'm going to do in the beginning are not real tricky stuff, but it gives you a good understanding of where we are in clinical trials. But before we get too far into this, I just want to give a little disclaimer here. The information that we're going to be presenting is for educational and informational use only. The data was originally presented, uh, the data on the Mavic Hampton trial was specifically presented at the 2020 American College of Cardiology virtual scientific sessions held later uh, or late last month, I guess it was. Uh, it is important to remember that this information is about a clinical trial and an investigational medication. No patient should alter their medical treatment without consulting their cardiologist or HCM specialist based on this presentation or frankly, any other data. The HCMA is presenting this information with data made publicly available by the American College of Cardiology. So we thank ACC for their virtual meeting this year. It was very helpful. As a disclosure, once we get into the information regarding the Maverick Hampton trial, Dr. Owens is an investigator in the Maverick HCM study, which is sponsored by Myocardia. Uh, so having said that, what's a clinical trial, right? So a phase one clinical trial, which we're gonna be talking about a phase two in a little bit. A phase one is testing on the drug uh, with healthy volunteers to check them at multiple doses. So you'll see sometimes you'll see advertisements, they're recruiting for a clinical trial. This is a phase one, just to see if it's safe in a healthy person. In the initial phase of testing, which can take several months to complete, there's a small number of healthy volunteers. And again, they're generally paid for their participation. That study is designed to determine the effect of the drug or a device on the human body and how it's absorbed, metabolized, excreted, et cetera. This phase of investigation can share side effects that can occur at different doses and at different levels and how they're increased. About 70% of experimental drugs pass this phase and get on to the next phase of testing. And obviously the drug we're talking about did because we're already in this phase two section. So what is a phase two clinical trial? It tests the effectiveness or efficacy, I should say, of the drug or device. This second phase can take several months to several years and can take a couple hundred patients uh, to get the data together. Most phase, two or most phase two trials are randomized trials with one group taking an experimental medication and the other group, the control group, taking a standard medication or a placebo. These studies are often blinded, which means neither the participant or the researcher knows who's on a drug versus a placebo. This is um, this allows the investigator to provide the pharmaceutical company or the sponsor and the FDA with information that is comparative and relates the effectiveness of the new drug based on the placebo or the old drug. About one third of experimental drugs get past phase one and phase two studies. Then we move to a phase three. These are randomized trials. They are blind tested in several hundred to seven th several thousand patients in average, but in cases of uncommon disorders or orphan diseases, that population number can be lower. 
This is a large scale testing. It can last several years and it provides the pharmaceutical company and the FDA a more thorough understanding of the effectiveness of the drug or the device, the benefits and the range of possible adverse outcomes. So it provides a lot of information. 70 to 90% of the drugs entering a phase three will complete the phase three. Once they've completed their phase three, the pharmaceutical company can go to the FDA and say, now we would like to market or sell this drug to the public. Some people think that's the end of the process and it isn't. <laughs> There's a phase four. These are called post-market surveillance trials and they're conducted after the drug or the device has been approved for consumer sale. The pharmaceutical company will then have several objectives when they get to this stage. They'll compare the drug to other drugs already on the market. They'll monitor the drug for long-term effectiveness and the impact on the patient's quality of life. They'll determine the cost effectiveness of the drug therapy related to other traditional or other new therapies. And based on this data, the drug or the device could actually be taken off the market or have restrictions placed upon it. The in, oops, sorry, you're seeing my, uh, sorry. Um, the study can result in drugs or device being taken off market or restrictions placed if the product has outcomes that we maybe didn't anticipate originally. How is that, Dr. Owens? And I did I do a good job of explaining clinical trials? Excellent trials? job. Okay. Yeah, sound like an expert. Okay, I, I, might, I might have maybe been on faculty for the FDA's recent <laughs> meeting on running clinical trials. Um, so now I'm gonna pivot and you're gonna notice a different name on this uh, screen. And that is Dr. Carolyn Ho, is, who is one of the other investigators and she presented the data at the American College Cardiology Conference. But today we have Dr. Owens with us who's going to be presenting. And I have the slide, so you have to go old school and say next slide, which I will do right now. These are the disclosures of Dr. Ho, and maybe you want to start from here. Yes, so Dr. Ho is one of our co-investigators, and as Lisa mentioned, she presented the data um, at one of our major scientific forums, the American Car College of Cardiology uh, annual meeting, and it was presented in one of the late breaking uh, clinical trials, which means it got a lot of attention from the scientific community, um, and is a great sign that it was um, an important trial. So you can go to the next slide. And before we dive into the actual data from the study, um, just a little bit of background that most of you know, which is that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy causes abnormal thickening of the walls of the left ventricle. We all know that results in abnormal filling and emptying of the heart muscle. And we know that it is often caused by a change in your DNA, meaning that it's hereditary, it can run in families. Within the broad category of HCM, we often subtype groups into what their heart looks like and how it functions when we take pictures with either an echo or an MRI. And we know that approximately two thirds of patients who have HCM have the form that we call obstructive, which means there's obstruction inside the heart to the flow of blood. So difficult to get blood out of the heart. And that results in a high pressure gradient inside the heart. We measure that on the echocardiogram. This group of patients, those with obstructive HCM have approved effective therapies, albeit some of them invasive, to treat their symptoms and to treat that underlying obstruction. And that's treatment such as alcohol septal ablation and septal myectomy that you all have heard about. There are a third of patients who don't have any measurable obstruction inside their heart when we look at them by echo. And we, we define that by a pressure gradient less than 30 when we measure on echo either at rest or during exercise. And the patients with this type of what we call non-obstructive HCM are really challenging to treat because we don't have to date any proven or approved drug therapies. We currently use a number of medications that are designed to treat other cardiovascular disorders like hypertension or tachycardia. These are medicines that you've heard of like beta blockers, metoprolol, atenolol, um, and calcium channel blockers like verapamil, diltiazem, and even sometimes diuretics or water pills. And we use these medicines to treat symptoms, which are usually consisting of shortness of breath, sometimes chest discomfort, exercise intolerance, um, fatigue, palpitations, and even sometimes fluid retention or heart failure symptoms. 
These symptoms, we think, in non-obstructive forms of HCM, are thought to result from the heart being thick and stiff and not relaxing very well. And so for patients that have extreme, severe, non-obstructive HCM, sometimes only cardiac transplant um, is an option. And Lisa's waving her hand there. <laughs> so it's not common, but it certainly happens. Um, and we don't have great treatment options. Therefore, we really are in need of, of a medication or a treatment that can treat non-obstructive HCM. And we'll talk a little bit about mavicantin and the way it works and how it might have the potential to improve heart function. You can move to the next slide. So here we have a very scientific looking slide that tells you a little bit about mavicantin, which is the name of the drug that was investigated in Maverick um, and the way it works. So mavicantin is the first in its class. It's a myosin inhibitor. And it is also being tested for patients with obstructive forms of HCM. That study you may have heard about is the phase three explorer study. We don't have results from that trial yet, but it has finished enrolling. And the way this drug works is on what we call the contractile unit or the squeezing part of the heart. It's called the sarcomere. And so I showed a couple of pictures on the left. There is a picture of a normal sarcomere or squeezing unit. And what you can see is there's a red filament, we call it, and then there's the purple one. So actin and myosin, you don't have to remember those things. But what happens, those two filaments interact with each other and they form what we call a cross bridge. And that's the part that's filling in the little circle. And that is what leads to normal squeezing and relaxing of the heart muscle. Now, one important thing that I learned in medical school that at first didn't make a whole lot of sense to me is that of course it takes energy to squeeze or to contract, but it also takes energy to relax. Relaxation of the heart muscle is an active process and it's an important one so that your heart has optimal performance. So if we look at the HCM sarcomeres, the ones pictured in the middle, what we have with HCM is something that we call hypercontractility, meaning the heart squeezes too forcefully. Um, and there are too many of those cross bridges formed. As a result of that, it's hard also for the heart to relax, so it does not relax normally. And the way that Mavicampton works is on the third picture, the one furthest to the right, and it works really on that contractile unit by reducing the number of cross bridges and decreasing that abnormal or excessive contractility. Um, and in, in doing this, it may also improve relaxation and the way the heart is using energy, which we think may be particularly helpful and relevant for patients who have non-obstructive HCM. You can go to the next slide. So Maverick HCM, which is the study we're here to talk about, was an exploratory, and these terms you'll recognize from the <laughs> beginning part, bless you, dear, Sorry. and divide, <laughs> allergies, and double blind, placebo controlled, dose ranging study. So a lot of big words to say that some people got the drug, some people got a placebo, nobody knew what anybody was getting, and the dose was varied amongst the group. And these were all patients who had symptoms from their non-obstructive HCM. And the primary goal of this study, which is a phase two study, was really to look at safety and tolerability. So could people take the drug safely without any major problems? And was it tolerable? Did it have any major side effects or were they able to take it and continue? In addition to that primary objective, safety and tolerability, they also looked at a few exploratory ways to see if the drug was um, effective. So it wasn't a big, huge study that looks at a lot of effectiveness, but really um, started to get a hint at effectiveness. Um, and to do that, you can see there's a number of things that were looked at, and I'll just walk you through a few of them. The first is a, a biomarker, something called NT-proBNP. 
And if you don't know your own NC-pro BNP, it's something that you might want to discuss with your physician, whether or not it's reasonable to check it, just to kind of get a ballpark. It's a measure of stress and stretch inside the heart. And so we measure that really from a blood sample. And in our patient population, we follow that over time to give us a sense of where the trajectory is going in terms of stress or stretch in the heart. It has been looked at in a number of studies in all kinds of patients with cardiovascular disease. And we know that it's a marker if it's rising of bad outcomes that may come. So it isn't a, a biomarker that's useful to be trended. Um, the second thing that we looked at in the study was something called a peak oxygen uptake or peak VO2. And that's a very objective measure of exercise tolerance. For those of you that haven't had that test, it's a test done either on a treadmill or a bike and you wear a mask and it actually measures your oxygen uptake. And so it's something that's very objective and again, can be followed over time or trended to see how your exercise tolerance is doing. In addition to that, we looked at something that's a little bit less objective. It's called a New York Heart Association functional class. And again, you can discuss this with your physician if you don't already know what your class is. This can vary over time and it's a scale. And we use that to assess exercise tolerance. And the scale goes from one to four with class one being someone who has no symptoms or exercise problems, and class four being someone who is very symptomatic, meaning they're having symptoms of shortness of breath even while they're resting. And then class two and class three is mild and moderate forms of um, symptom uh, exercise intolerance. So you get shorter breath, say for example, with climbing up a flight of stairs, or you get shorter breath when you're out for a walk or doing light gardening, and it's a scale that we use. Um, the, we also looked at, importantly, echocardiogram. So that, of course, is our ultrasound of the heart, and it's a way to measure both the ejection fraction, and we also measured a little bit more about relaxation function, and that's the E over E prime, or a measure of how the heart is filling. And the last thing that they looked at is a little bit more um, scientific and involved, but it really is a sense of whether or not you reached a, an endpoint saying that you had improvement in your exercise tolerance. Okay, you can move to the next slide there. So here's a breakdown of the study design. And again, it can look complicated, but we're gonna break it down. And basically what it shows is that the participants in this study were randomized. So they were placed randomly into three groups. Um, and group one, received the dose, received Mavicamptin, which is a study drug, um, targeting a blood concentration of 200 nanograms from, per milliliter. And again, you don't have to remember that, but that was sort of the low dose group. And then group two received Mavicamptin, uh, targeting a higher blood concentration of 500. And the third group received placebo. So what these groupings allowed is for the study to look at a range of doses of Mavicamptin, again, which is what you want to do in a phase two trial. You want to get a sense of how the drug is at varying doses. And all of the participants in this study were on the therapy, either uh, Mavicamptin or the placebo, for a total of 16 weeks. And then they had an eight-week washout period where we still monitored them and we still monitored their biomarkers, the nt and uh, the troponin and the echo. All participants in this study were started on five milligrams of mavicantin. And the dose importantly really was just adjusted once during the study at week six. And it was adjusted in this um, clinical trial based on the concentration of the drug in the blood. And just to give you a, an idea, we don't generally do that for most of the drugs that we use in the real world. You know, as you're sitting with your cardiologist and you're talking about what dose you're gonna use of your metoprolol or verapamil or any other medication, we usually uh, base the dose on what your heart looks like, how you're feeling, maybe following some of those levels like an NT-pro BNP, but we very rarely um, in the real world follow the drug concentration level. There's a few exceptions for that. and, and uh, Lisa might know one of them <laughs> for uh, immunosuppression, but in, in most cases, we don't do that. 
Um, importantly, they also had a few pre-specified stopping criteria. And that was just to make sure that the dose didn't go too high and that the concentration in the blood didn't go too high or that there weren't markers on your echo that your heart was changing in a meaningful way. And we'll go through that a little bit more. Next slide, please. So picture here, and again, this table can be very scientific and overwhelming, but we're gonna break it down. Really, this just looked at the baseline characteristics of the group of patients that were in the study. And so typically we look at them by the, what they were assigned to. So you'll see on the left, there was group one that had the lower concentration of mavicantin, group two, the higher concentration. And then we put those two groups together in the third column because they're the ones who were getting the drug. And we call that the pooled group of mavicantin, those patients that were receiving the drug. Um, and you can see there were uh, 40 of them total that were receiving mavicantin and 19 that were receiving the sugar pill or the placebo, and that's the far column. So what we like to see when we look at this table is that the characteristics were similar across the treatment groups so that we're removing any other sort of uh, bias or uh, problem into the study. And what you can see is that they are. So the average age was about 54 years and about 50% or just a little bit more than that were female. And most participants in the study were that functional class two that I mentioned on a scale from one to four, four being the most symptomatic, one being asymptomatic. So you did have to have symptoms to get into this study. Um, and you'll recall that we looked at the baseline value of the NT pro BNP, and that's listed down there. Uh, Lisa will point it out to you. That's that level that we're looking at for a marker of stretch in the heart. And you had to be above 300 in order to get into the study. And you can see that on these groups, uh, the average was much higher than that. So there were patients that um, had a significant amount of stretch in their heart at baseline. Um, great. Another finding was that a third of patients, and you'll see just underneath that is the troponin line, um, and it's called CTNI, the troponin I there, and that's a marker, again, of cardiac injury or strain in the heart, and sometimes your physician will follow that, sometimes not, um, but we have very... Um, high level testing that can be done, high sensitivity testing to, to pick up even small amounts of injury that's going on. And a notable finding within this group of patients is about a third of them had a marker of this ongoing injury just at baseline. That's before they had received the drug or anything. Good, we'll go to the uh, next slide. Here's the baseline echo parameter. So again, looking at cardiac ultrasound, you wanna make sure when you're looking at the baseline that everybody's pretty much the same and that it's fairly typical for the patient population that you're trying to study. And in this group, um, it's non-obstructive HCM. So we would expect that their peak gradient is low, which it is, you can see on the bottom line and that they're a pretty typical group of patients with HCM where your mean wall thickness of the left ventricle is about two centimeters, which would be pretty typical for a non-obstructive uh, group. And that your ejection fraction is normal to hyperdynamic, which it is, the ejection fraction here is in the you know, high 60s. So next we'll look at safety data. And we can go to the next slide, here we go. Uh, this is a table summarizing the adverse events that were um, experienced by the study participants. And I think the way to summarize this is that Mavicampton was generally well tolerated by most participants. You know, we didn't have a whole lot of people dropping out or anything like that. Um, and the line that shows um, at the top, just above the table, I think is probably the take home message, which is that the overall rate of serious adverse events was low at 10.3 and notably was twice as high in the placebo arm compared to the active treatment arm. So, you know, patients were having adverse events and symptoms even when they were getting a sugar pill. Um, most of the serious adverse events were cardiovascular in origin. And you would expect that for a group of patients that have a cardiovascular condition, that they were gonna be reporting things like atrial fib, atrial flutter, um, chest discomfort, things that a cardiac population would have. So we can go to the next slide. Next for safety data, we took a look at the effect of mavicantin 
on the ejection fraction. Now, again, you'll recall that the ejection fraction is a measure that we take by echocardiogram or ultrasound. And it really is a measurement of the percentage of blood that's squeezed out of the heart with each heartbeat. And you're not aiming for 100 here. So normal is between about 50, 60, 65 thereabout. And it's not uncommon, it's actually expected in HCM that you have normal to hyperdynamic function. So that ejection fraction at baseline of the patients that we looked at was in the high 60s, 67, 68%. And we look to see what happened to the ejection fraction as patients were treated with Mavicamptin. And the reason we did that is that we know the way that Mavicamptin works, that Mavicamptin, the mechanism of action, decreases that hypercontractile state. So it makes it a little less hypercontractile. And so it can affect your ejection fraction. And so what we saw on this slide, and I think the best way to sort of summarize it is that for the vast majority of patients, most of the time, there was not a significant change in the ejection fraction. So if you looked at that pooled group, and again, that third column is the people who were receiving Mavicantin, uh, there was a mild reduction in the mean ejection fraction of 4% compared to the placebo group, which was 2%. And for those of you who aren't that familiar with reading echoes and looking at oh, echoes, I'm sure you've looked at your own and looked at the uh, reports, a change of 5% is sometimes within the range of uh, observer difference. So you'll have one echo that shows you at 70, your next echo comes in at 65, and you tell your cardiologist, is this a major change? In the vast majority of cases, it is not. When there's a change from 70% down to 30% or you know, 20%, that is a major change. But within 5% um, is sometimes within the range of error. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So looking a little bit deeper into that ejection fraction data, which again, I think is important with the mechanism of action. There were five people who participated in the study who met that stopping criteria. So remember they put some stopping criteria in to say if your heart was changing and it might be significant, let's go ahead and stop you from the drug just to be careful and take a look at them. And so anybody who met an LVEF or ejection fraction less than 45% on their echo, we, they automatically just stopped the drug. And what you can see of the five people who met that, three of them, the top three, had no symptoms at all. They were feeling fine. They had no heart failure or anything. Uh, but because they met the stopping criteria, they were taken off the drug. All of them came in with a normal ejection fraction that's listed at the top there, the baseline EF. And for all of them, the ejection fraction was trending back towards normal or reached back to their baseline at the end of the study. And they were not allowed to go back onto the drug. In two participants, the ones listed at the bottom, they did have symptoms and the last patient listed did require hospitalization. Now I'm looking a little bit more in detail, that particular patient had a recurrence of rapid atrial fibrillation, which importantly he had before he had enrolled into the study. Um, and as some of you know who have atrial fibrillation, it is common to occur in patients with HCM and it can be a trigger in and of itself for symptoms, for decompensation, for fluid retention, and even for a drop in the ejection fraction. And in this particular patient, you'll note that his ejection fraction only really returned it back to his baseline, which was normal, after treatment of his atrial fibrillation. He was treated with a cardioversion and ultimately with an invasive ablation procedure. Um, you know, to me, this, this data speaks to the fact that we titrate based not on drug concentration, but rather by clinical um, characteristics, and that's generally what we do in the real world. And this was a, a clinical study. So next slide, and we'll start to look at the exploratory results. So again, uh, the study was not a huge one powered to look at efficacy, but we were able to get some signals of efficacy and look at that in an exploratory way. So the first thing we looked at, thank you, Lisa, was the reduction in nt pro -BMP. And again, that's that level or um, marker that we can see in the blood of stretch inside the heart, the filling pressures and um, how full the heart is. And you can see on the topmost line, which is the dotted line, 
Those are the people who were receiving the placebo or sugar pill. And over the course of the study, they had a 1% reduction in their pro anti pro BNP. The people who were receiving Mavicemptin are represented by the light blue line. That's the group that had the lower concentration in their blood and the dark blue line. And those were the people that had the higher concentration in their blood. And what was remarkable is that the nt pro -BMP decreased by approximately 50% by week four of the study. That's that first marker there that Lisa's pointing out. And it stayed lower throughout the end of the treatment period. And you can see there when the drug stopped and we had the washout, that the levels increased back to their baseline abnormal values. So this was remarkable and it was statistically significant, meaning when we did our analysis and the statistics, this was not just by chance that this happened. This was felt to be an effect of the drug. Um, and further evidence of that is the dark blue line where you see the people that were getting a higher concentration in their blood of the, of the drug and that titration occurred at about week um, six. And by week eight, they had an even lower uh, value of their NT pro BNP, which we think may be a dose dependent effect. So for me as a clinical cardiologist treating patients all day, this is remarkable because we don't usually see a drop in your NT pro BNP of this magnitude, even with the best of what we try for medical therapy. And we know from other studies that NT pro BNP is an independent predictor or marker of adverse outcomes in patients with HCM. So perhaps this shows us that there may be a benefit from this drug. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. So the next slide was looking at another marker, which is the troponin. And again, we talked about that being a sign of some underlying cardiac injury that's going on. Now, you may have heard of troponin or read about troponin in the context of a heart attack. Um, so if you're having a big heart attack, not related to your HCM, but because of a blockage of your coronary arteries, you can have a sudden extreme rise in your troponin that tells you there's a major damage and injury going on in cardiac muscle cells dying. This is not that degree of troponin elevation as you would be having with an acute heart attack, but rather what we call maybe a subclinical or low level of injury that can be picked up by, um, by a troponin assay or a sensitive troponin assay. And you'll remember we talked about at baseline, about a third of the patients in the study had an elevation of their troponin. So when we looked at that group that came into the study before getting any drug that had an elevated troponin, we followed it over this course of the study. And what you can see there is again, the dotted line at the top is the group of patients receiving placebo, no active drug, and there was no real change in their troponin over time. In the patients who received Mavicemptin, represented by the solid blue line, you can see that there was a reduction in their troponin over the time that they were receiving the drug. And it seemed to be continuing to slowly but surely gradually go down, even at the time that, this, that the drug was taken off at week 16. So there was still a, a reduction in the troponin going on. So hinting to perhaps it would have continued to go down even further. We don't know that because the, the study was stopped at that point as planned. And then a washout period, the troponin went back to being the abnormal baseline. So again, this tells us and makes us wonder, is there a physiologic effect of this drug that's beneficial to patients who have HCM and have some underlying injury? Um, next slide. This slide really looked at that exploratory uh, impact of functional capacity. And this is, it was a little bit of a more complicated um, uh, impact or look. And it was the endpoint of increasing your peak VO2, which is that special treadmill test baseline. And at the end of the study, did you improve your exercise tolerance objectively so we could measure? Or did you have an increase or an improvement in your functional class, which is your New York Heart Association, that scale from one to four? For example, if you started as a three, did you move up to a two? 
which is better exercise tolerance? Did you go from only being able to go up one flight of stairs to being able to walk, you know, two or three blocks? That would be a meaningful improvement. And I think as patients, you know, you could say for yourself, what would be meaningful? Can I now go and get my mail at the end of the block? Can I play with my grandkids in the in the yard? You know, can I jog? So those are the kinds of meaningful improvements that people are looking for. And what you can see here, the first two graphs show that there wasn't a statistically significant change in this composite endpoint. But what I think is um, interesting and needs further evaluation and hopefully another study is that last graph, the third bar. And that showed in the patients that um, was the subgroup of having elevated troponin at baseline, so a marker of injury and patients who had an echo marker on their ultrasound of having higher pressures, higher, higher filling pressures in their heart, abnormal relaxation of the muscle, that was the group that showed a benefit. And again, this was a subgroup, so it wasn't all the patients. It's like honing in on the group of people who may stand to benefit the most from a drug like Mavicantin. So last slide and um, sort of in conclusion, we'll do a couple of takeaways which is that this was a phase two study. It was dose ranging, and it looked at patients with symptoms from non-obstructive HCM. We know that a reduction in the ejection fraction can occur, needs to be watched, and perhaps that it's better to do what we do in real life, which is guide our therapy by your echo, your biomarkers, and not so much by the concentration level in your blood. And this was the first study to show an improvement in some of those biomarkers that we look at in your blood, the NT-ProV and PD um, and the troponin. And there was a suggestion in this study that perhaps patients with more severe underlying disease coming in were the people who may benefit the most, which are intriguing results. So we hope that myocardia um, will further study the drug in a larger trial. Um, and I certainly would be um, excited to participate. And I think some of my patients would uh, be very excited to participate. We have um, several patients in our um, group who have gone on to the long-term extension where you're able to receive the drug in what we call open label. So I know they're getting it, they know they're getting it, and we're following them over time. And we've some, seen some encouraging results. I'll stop there, it's a lot of info. That was a lot of info, but a lot of very good info. So I will do the acknowledgement slide because these things don't happen in a silo. And I want to thank a number of the participants, the patients who actually are HCMA members and, and we've communicated to them in the beginning of the trial, they get enrolled in the trial, they did the whole trial all the way through. And I know we recruited a great number of people to the study. So if you're watching this, thank you. Thank you very much for giving your time. And to the authors and the investigators, and that includes everybody. And I'm gonna pause here for a second and say, in today's world, we're all getting a different view of our healthcare providers. Healthcare doesn't occur in a silo and it's not with one person, there's an entire team. So for every author, there's other people behind them. For the site investigators, there's other people behind them. There's clinical coordinators, there's sonographers, there's administrators, there's a whole team that makes all of this happen. So thank you to everybody who has given their time and talent and their bodies to this research. Absolutely. I'm going to say now it's time for questions. We have those really big, heavy slides. So I just put up a little puppy and kitten to lighten the mood a little. Um, Ed, I will get to your question in a moment, but I would like to start with questions about the study and about the trials. Um, we'll have a few moments for some general HCM questions at the end. Um, so let's see. I'm trying to figure out if these are HCM related or are they? Um, okay, so Amy, I'm going to bring your question up to screen. Um, I am not open. I am on open label, not seeing quite the fabulous results, but if it helps anything, it's worth it. So that is a self-disclosed participant uh, on open label. Um, and the fun thing about, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna not pose this as a question, I'm, I'm gonna make it as a statement and then I, uh, Dr. Owens can comment on it. HCM is really hard to sometimes know what our symptoms are and aren't. 
because we've acclimated to the heart that we have and normal is just a word that doesn't have any real meaning to us because our hearts have never been normal in our in our memory in all likelihood. So to say, you know, I'm not seeing fabulous results, but what would it be if there was nothing there? It's sometimes hard to tell what normal is and how good you can be. So I think these trial results and any drug therapy is going to vary greatly be between individuals. And I think we're going to need a lot of big data to really see who is going to be the best, who's going to receive the best benefit from any particular agent, therapy, surgery, catheter-based uh, procedure, device. So it takes a lot to figure out who's the best suited. Yeah. The other thing I would add to that is that, you know, although we started off by saying there's two big groups of patients, those with obstructive and those with non-obstructive, within both of those groups, and particularly within the non-obstructive HCM group of patients, you can subtype a lot of different forms of non-obstructive HCM. And not all non-obstructive HCM is, is one thing. And so really having a conversation with your doctor about what parts of your heart are the most abnormal and where you might stand to benefit. And as we develop newer newer therapies, hopefully we'll be able to target them to subpopulations, even within HCM and within non-obstructive HCM to say, ah, your heart looks more like this and this therapy might benefit you the most, whereas a different therapy might benefit someone whose heart looks differently and acts differently. So um, I think there will be variability in how people respond. Well, to that point, we have our next comment. <laughs> and this is from Kelly, who is nearing the end of two years in the study in October. She'd like to know what happens at this point. She doesn't want to stop because she feels it has added to her quality of life. So if somebody's done with the trial and they're on open extension, how long can they stay on open extension? So it's completely up to myocardia, so I, I won't speak for them. But as far as I know, they have not set an end point that they will stop uh, the open label treatment. So as far as I know, in the patients that we have in our open label, um, the treatment is ongoing for now, but I don't know how long that will be. Okay. I do want to go back and just tease out data, and I know what I'm going to do is... Um, it's it's way early, and I'm talking about two individual things here, uh, two events. AFib, you've got, there's a total of how many people here? There's 40, 60 people that we're talking about in this trial, placebo and, and, and drug. 25% of people with HCM are going to have atrial fibrillation. So when we look at this data, it's right there. It's, it's nothing unusual, but I can't help but notice that both of the AFibs were in the higher dosing. And could that end up being some fine line that we have to figure out how to dance in dosing? Or yeah. was it just HCM giving AFib? I, you know, I think with these numbers being so small, it may just be random and chance and HCM and AFib. I think we'd need more data to really look at it. And obviously with uh, HCM, AFib is something that we always will look at, but I think it's a little too small to say, you know, because it, it's hard to know. I, I, if it was one in one, I wouldn't have even thought that it would be dose, dose specific, mm -hmm. but who knows? Something to look at. The other thing I wanted to bring up to look at is, and, and I will tell you up front, my biggest concern over this particular trial was if you have those with HCM who are non-obstructed, we do tend to drop out our ejection fraction and we can go into end stage or burnt out HCM. So my biggest fear in this trial was, are we gonna drop ES too much? And are we going to push people into end stage or burnt out disease? And yes, we saw the drop, but it didn't seem significant and it didn't drop anybody into, except for the, the ones that were excluded from the trial, which may have genetic reasons, who knows, um, but they bounced back. So it really does speak to the fact that you're altering the heart while this drug is there, Redu remove the drug, it can go back to normal. So even if the EF dropped too much, it looks pretty safe that it will come back 
without any consequence. Yes, it appears to be a reversible effect. Um, as you can see by the ejection fractions, at least trending toward or achieving their baseline status. So again, smaller numbers. So I think we need more data on that. And picking the patient, as you alluded to, is of utmost importance. So if it's a patient who you think is on the border of switching over to that systolic dysfunction, advanced stage HCM, lots of fibrosis in the heart, signs and symptoms of heart failure. If you do get invasive hemodynamics or measurements of pressures inside the heart and the cardiac output, they're bordering on abnormal for the cardiac output. You know, those are patients that maybe aren't best suited for this drug therapy. So I think, again, it's selecting the patient uh, that would benefit from the drug is very, very important. So we're very early on in this process. This is a phase two. And at the beginning of this presentation, we talked about phase two moves to phase three, then that lasts for a long time. And then FDA reviews it and says, yes, you can sell this or you can't. But pretend just for a moment that we aren't speaking of this trial. We're just speaking of a phase three that's almost done. The question from one of our viewers is typically after a phase three ends, how long before Medicare will actually cover the therapy? It's a good question. I don't know. Um, a really it, good question because I don't know either. Yeah, I mean, you've got to get through FDA approval. And usually once the FDA approves the therapy, that's when the payers start to say, okay, we're going to cover it. Um, but how long that period is, I'm, you know, frankly, I don't know. Um, we try to get the data once it's done through the, through the phase three before the FDA, um, as soon as possible. Most of the sponsors want to get the drug approved as quickly as possible. Um, but there's obviously regulation and, um, and things that have to happen. So I don't know exact a time frame. I know it is a regulatory process. Um, I'm sure that they're already getting all their paperwork in order to submit it for if it's five years from now, they're probably ready to do it already because they want to get it done. Um, but I'm sure they will do it as quickly as they possibly can. And remember, this is going to be a labeled indication drug uh, we're, or we're hoping it will be, or let me just take it away from Navic Hampton and just say any phase three that goes to, to market they want to get it approved as quickly as possible for the payers to pay for. And after they get approval for a new drug, they have a period of time where they can produce the drug themselves. There will be no generic for a number of years. And then after that, there are some extensions that they can put on if they retweak the drug a little bit. But you're not going to get this in generic form anytime soon or any new drug doesn't go immediately to generic. Um, would it take Lipitor like nine years or something like that to go to generic? But I'm, I'm learning about that right now in Bottle of Lies, crazy book. But oh. stay tuned next week for an interview with the author of that one. But you're you're not going to have uh, access to the drug outside of the name brand for a very long period of time. So Ross, I'm a little confused with your question. Looking forward to HCM and AFib qualifications. What do you mean by qualifications? So are you wondering if this drug can be taken with AFib present? And do we really know that the AFib should have stopped the particular drug? Or is there any indication on Mavic Hampton with um, any regard in this study to atrial involvement? How about that? Um, so patients with history of atrial fibrillation were allowed to be enrolled into the study and they were allowed to stay on uh, some of their antiarrhythmic medications. We looked through them and there were some exclusions and some that were allowed. Um, the, as far as we know, and again, we didn't look at atrial function specifically um, in the study because it's a little hard to look at. You can get atrial contraction a little bit better by, by MRI. Um, so we didn't look specifically at atrial function in, in this. Although you can sort of get a surrogate of what's going on in the atria by the NT pro BNP levels. When the pressures inside the left ventricle are high, generally that is reflected back into the left atrium, the top chamber, and we can see some you know, measures of stretch or strain there as well. Um, so if they, 
so Ross is saying that he was declined entry into the study because he had AFib before, or maybe was inactive AFib. Might have been that you were in persistent or or in AFib at the time, um, but we there was an allowance for patients with a history of AFib. So I'm not sure what exactly was the exclusion for you. Um, right. Could have been that you were actively in, actively in AFib or that there were other markers on the EKGs that were followed, like a QT interval um, or a QTC interval. It could have been something like that. I'm not sure. Okay. So just clarification, AFib was not the disqualifier. The disqualifier was the drop in ejection fraction. Got it. Yep. So they were able to stay in, but this particular individual had AFib. Okay. I just want to clarify because I may yep. have, I may have gotten that one wrong for a bit. Oh, there we go, popping through there. A um, couple of other questions. Um, so one of the other participants had AFib in the past and she wasn't, she didn't have AFib at that point in time. I'm gonna go back into some just general HCM related questions. Um, and I'm going to use a little bit of humor here because Ed, you posted the same question twice and the question was about memory. So I was wondering if you forgot that you posted it the first time. <laughs> I'm being silly, just teasing you, Ed. Um, is it possible to start losing memory or brain cells from HCM over the years? I've noticed a loss in my memory, having a hard time speaking without juggling my words, maybe not enough oxygen in the brain, question mark? Mm -hmm. No, I certainly would take a look at two things, both the flow of, of blood getting to your brain or your cardiac output, um, and two, whether or not you're having arrhythmias that are going unnoticed that um, certainly for AFib, if it's not known and you're not on a blood thinner, then you can have over time, small strokes or transient events um, that over time can affect your memory by having. So I think I would start with looking at those two things. The other thing is that sometimes as a side effect of some of the medications, patients report that their concentration or their memory is not as good. So taking a close look at your medications and making sure that it's not a side effect of one of them. I think this is an area that is ripe for research, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, having gone through my transplant and, as I called it, the quieting of my brain, and then my post-transplant life, which not only does your brain wake up, but it wakes up literally on steroids. <laughs> it's, a little, it's a little challenging for a couple of weeks there to balance all that energy, but you do it. But going into transplant, I did notice that I had a lot of brain fog and my meds hadn't changed. Mm -hmm. So it was, it did feel as if I just wasn't getting enough oxygen anywhere. Absolutely. And, and I think we need to study that better to understand those early triggers of when does that oxygen level shift or the absorption of oxygen in our brain shift. And maybe we can identify who is getting down the wrong path. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And really it may come down to cardiac output. So if you're in a lower cardiac output state where cardiac output is really just the amount of you know, liters per minute of blood that's being squeezed out to the rest of your body, if your organs are not getting the adequate blood supply, and that holds true for your kidneys and your liver and your brain, they will start to show the effects in various ways. You know, the kidneys we pick up on blood testing, the liver we pick up on blood testing, but the way we pick up brain function is really how, how you're feeling, how you're functioning, how your memory is what your cognition is. And so certainly it can be an effect of a low cardiac output. So yes, it might be related. We have another general question from one of your patients. Um, it's, she thinks your team is top notch um, and hoping that you can provide some insight, excuse me, into how long or how often MRIs are needed in HCM patient. If one MRI is taken and the condition was diagnosed, when should the next one be? Yeah, you know, MRIs we don't think of as like echoes where we do an echo usually once a year. MRIs, I would say um, once every several years or if there's a marked change in either your symptoms or your clinical status and we wonder if something is going on, then maybe perhaps getting that information sooner. The major benefit of MRI above echo um, at this point is really to look at the burden or amount of scarring or fibrosis that's in the heart. As long as we get reasonably good echo images, we can see the anatomy or the way the heart is formed and shaped and the wall thickness. Um, but we get additional information about scarring and fibrosis. And so usually we don't need that every year, but every few several years, if there's a change, we sometimes ask for another MRI. Proving Ed had a sense of humor. 
You caught my humor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so Kelly had been informed regarding of the um, on our trial participation, told that it was a perfusion issue, um, that she was in bad shape when she started off, and things have improved. Um, yes, I know. I know, Kelly, we started talking about you following my path, and I suggested you take an alternate one. Um, so that's a good thing. So it looks like we're wrapped up with our questions. If anybody has any last questions, this is your last warning to ask them now or forever hold your peace or until we get somebody else online to ask questions of. Um, I will pause here and just ask, how are all things COVID in Philadelphia? Things COVID are uh, on the rise in Philadelphia, but so far, um, you know, I can only speak to Penn. We're, we're doing okay. We have a number of surge plans in place, um, including possibly, you know, activating new units, which we've done, and potentially even opening some of the beds in the new pavilion um, to allow for increased capacity for all of our patients and separation of patients who need to be in a COVID negative area, which is important. So trying to cohort patients. So I think things are certainly on the rise, um, but so far manageable. So we've had a couple of patients with HCM and COVID now, one called right before we started here to confirm he's COVID positive in New Jersey. Um, the, the three that I'm aware of are doing okay. Nothing major complication wise. Are you, do you have any specific concerns for the HCM population in the COVID era? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, what we're recommending to anybody with an underlying cardiomyopathy, such as HCM, um, is to try your best to, you know, avoid contact with crowds in public and do all those safety things that everybody should be doing, um, and to pay close attention to your symptoms should you get um, infection. Because we do know that their uh, coronavirus, the novel coronavirus, can cause a myocarditis or an inflammation of the heart muscle, um, leading to arrhythmias and heart failure. And so we are particularly attuned to that in patients who do have an already underlying cardiac condition. So we're giving kind of standard plus be extra careful guidelines, but certainly not to stop any medicines or anything like that. Um, take your usual cardiac medications. And if you do get infected, low science symptoms, low threshold to, to be evaluated and let your cardiologist know just so they can watch out for you. Yeah. So we've been suggesting since the onset, if you do come up with a diagnosis or suspicion, please contact your cardiologist and HCM specialist. If you have one, even if they're not in your local area, most physicians are now taking um, telemedicine visits or phone call visits. So you can consult and make sure that your COVID team in your local hospital is talking to your cardiology team, wherever they might be. If you don't have an HCM specialist at this point, I have a number of physicians who are willing to jump in and speak to doctors in general about HCM so that they have a better understanding on how to treat you in the ER. So if you need to reach out to the HCMA and have us hook you up with somebody, please don't hesitate to do that. Um, we do have a couple of other questions that did pop in and they're really good ones, so I don't wanna miss it. Um, so Scott wants clarification. You mentioned an echo and stress echo every year. Is Did you mean that? Because it seems like some people might not be doing their echoes annually. Um, generally speaking, in our, in our patients that we follow, we do a stress echo every year. And with that stress echo, we get a, a resting echo as well. So we'll do a full baseline echo where we measure all the chambers, look at the valves, look at the function of the heart. Then we do the treadmill portion, the stress part, and then we follow up with an echo right after you get off the treadmill. And for the vast majority of our patients, we do a stress echo imaging every year. There are exceptions to that, like anything else. So in, in conjunction with your cardiologist and what they think is best for you, but in the vast majority of our patients, we do. So I have to say, I'm a little concerned about this next question. I'm going to pop up. So Angela said, so HCM patients should have ongoing echoes. I was diagnosed in 2014, haven't had an echo since. Yes, uh, patients with HCM should have ongoing echoes. And the reason is that the heart can change over time. And so we like to keep ahead of that and be uh, aware of how the heart might be changing um, as time goes on. So generally speaking, we do an echo every year, every few years at the most, um, but um, yes. Yeah, six years is a little too long, girlfriend. Call me, I'll help you find somebody who can do this for you. Um, Kathleen, you wanted to know if um, you can watch this video later. This video uh, is going to be placed on our HCMA YouTube channel, which is HCMA USA, and it will also be on our website. So you will be able to find it there and you will find it here on Facebook as well. 
Um, that one doubled up too. Uh, does someone who did not qualify for this study get a second chance? Studies closed now. So they're, we're not, they're not accepting any more people into the study. There will be another study from a, another sponsor coming up shortly, and there will be additional studies, we presume, coming out from myocardia on different subpopulations. So stay tuned for new uh, trial opportunities. That sound about right? Yep. Okay. And can you ask why she hasn't? No. Um, so, okay. We have a sidebar conversation here. Um, Angela, Anthony wants to know why you have not had another echocardiogram. Um, I'm going to guess because your physician might not know a lot about HCM and maybe it's time to go back and do that again. So please take care of that one. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, have taken a, an hour of this good doctor's time and I'm sure she has things to get onto. And I do want to give her an extra gold star because at the beginning of this interview, I heard a small child screaming in the background while she was going through data slides without missing a beat. Oops. And we lost her. <laughs> and we, as I'm complimenting her, she goes away. Uh, technology. Uh, okay. So sorry about that. So we'll hide that. And I'm just going to tell you all, thank you very much for joining us. And I hope you have a great day and stay well, stay inside, wash your hands and stay away from the COVID-19 virus. Take care.